I'd like to begin now. Um, so uh, welcome everyone um, to another session of Networking Friday's webinar, a series that's organized under the Atlantic International Research Center, otherwise known as the AIR Center. Uh, I realize that uh, many of the people on this call are in uh, different time zones than the home institution of AIR, which is located in Portugal. So uh, good morning to some, good morning uh, and afternoon to others. Uh, uh, perhaps you're starting the day, uh, perhaps you're ending the day. So good evening uh, to those of you um, uh, still farther uh, dispersed over the time zones. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Dwarsmarty. I'm from the City University of New York, uh, something called the Advanced Science Research Center. And I direct um, uh, one of the initiatives there. I'll, I'll mention that uh, a little bit more detail in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll be moderating the uh, effort today. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, who are new to the AIR family, uh, each week, uh, Fridays, AIR Center hosts a series of guest speakers, uh, as well as interactive discussions with now literally thousands of uh, attendees. Uh, those attendees represent a, a broad spectrum of constituencies, uh, with people from government, from academia, uh, multilateral organizations, the private sector, uh, as well as civil society. Um, the topics and the audiences are extremely uh, interdisciplinary uh, and they're also extremely international from the standpoint that we have 115 countries and overseas territories distributed across the planet that participate in this activity. Um, I would encourage all of you, if you're, you're new to, the, to the, this world, uh, to seek out videos of, of past sessions. These are available uh, at the AIR Center's YouTube channel. And if you uh, check the uh, chat, uh, there's going to be a link posted by Jose Montillo who has uh, convened us. Um, there's also uh, uh, information on upcoming sessions that is available on the webinar webpage uh, of the AIR uh, Center. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from the City University of New York, uh, and uh, I head up uh, a research initiative within this broader building here. This is called the Advanced Science Research Center. We have uh, five domains of science that's represented. I direct the top floor of this uh, building, which is on our, our, our fifth floor. Uh, it's called the Environmental Sciences uh, Initiative, and in the spirit of the uh, AIR Center, uh, we also are interdisciplinary. And for us, one of the major uh, tasks, uh, being part of the university and serving the needs of our university community. And, and for those of you who are interested in such facts, uh, we have 500,000 students that are matriculated across the many campuses of the uh, City University of New York. And this is uh, one of the core facilities that draws together researchers from the many uh, campuses. And there are uh, over 20 campuses distributed across the city uh, of New York. And we invite researchers from uh, our campuses, uh, as well as the New York City metropolitan area, the region, uh, nationally, and also internationally. And one of the um, main challenges for us is to uh, talk in a a fruitful way across many uh, different domains of science. And I'm perfectly uh, uh, comfortable uh, talking about global scale um, environmental problems and hopefully environmental uh, problem solution sets. Uh, but, but by the same token, there are uh, people distributed within our building who are working right down to the finest of, uh, of spatial scales, uh, in uh, literally the angstrom scale. And somehow we are able to bridge these different um, scales. Uh, I'm happy again, working at the global scale. They're happy working at the molecular scale. And we recognize that you know, some of the, main, the, the world's major environmental problems are also problems that involve chemistry. For example, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other radiatively important uh, gases. Um, today's speaker 
uh, is uh, Jim Kostopoulos. Uh, we've uh, known each other, I suppose, for about three years now, and he's uh, heading up something called uh, the Global uh, Oceans Initiative. He's the CEO and founder of that. And uh, from the last graphic, you could see that I'm quite comfortable embracing uh, anyone who's thinking at the global scale. Uh, and as he will discuss today, there's all sorts of science that informs that global perspective. Uh, prior to being at uh, Global Oceans, he was president uh, at an industrial products distribution firm. His earlier work uh, involved startups. He was in senior management of several manufacturing companies. And I think as you hear his talk today, uh, you're going to see some of that uh, reflected. He's uh, an expert on supply chain strategies and uh, lo global logistics, uh, always thinking quite, uh, quite, uh, in quite big fashion, okay? And I was really impressed when we met three years ago when he, uh, he presented to me this very interesting, innovative idea, uh, in some sense, uh, repurposing idle uh, maritime shipping assets for research, uh, uh, very much in the spirit of the sharing economy, uh, if you want to say Airbnb or Uber, but in the best sense of the word, sharing e economy and, and enabling all kinds of new science to be done and uh, uh, enabling accessibility to research platforms uh, for uh, countries distributed across the economic uh, spectrum. Uh, he does have a background in biology, and I think you're going to see some of that also coming into the foreground during his uh, d discussion uh, today. Uh, he's done some work in uh, invertebrate physiology at San Diego uh, State University. Um, I should mention that as we go through the, um, the discussion today that Jim's going to be leading, uh, there's a question and answer a Q and A box at the bottom of your um, Zoom interface here. Uh, please post your questions to the Q and A, not the chat but the Q&A uh, box that sits at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so without any further delay, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Jim Kostopoulos. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Jim, and I think you could take over uh, at, at this point. Jim, it's Thank all you, yours. Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, well, th thank you again for those comments. And um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, thank you also to the AIR Center for uh, inviting me to participate in the Networking Fridays and to Jose Matino and Caterina Duarte for their help in setting this up. And uh, thank you all for participating today. Um, I'll start by just reiterating that uh, Global Oceans is a US-based nonprofit organization located in New York. We're focused on mobilizing infrastructure assets, as Charlie mentioned, including ships, portable workspace modules, primarily from the commercial sector for short-term use of scientific research vessels. And in addition to that, and probably even more importantly, we are developing research projects with international teams of scientists that are uniquely enabled by this model. Uh, so the future of ocean science is a big topic. Uh, there are lots of good studies that have been uh, published about that, including some from places like the European Marine Board and the US National Academy of Sciences, their decadal studies. Um, these are very important documents that talk about the future of ocean science. Um, and uh, they address that very well. So building scale, which I refer to in the title, can refer to several aspects of research, but here it means increasing physical capacity for scientific work at sea, primarily with research ships and vehicles that are best deployed from ships, but in a way that's adaptable and scalable and that can better uh, facilitate future needs. Um, the existing large infrastructure paradigm of research vessel ownership is by institutions and governments, and they can now be complemented by this approach uh, that I'll describe in a little a bit more detail. And we're also exploring uh, how MARVs uh, can lower the cost and availability threshold for participation 
uh, by emerging science communities internationally that don't otherwise have access, including through cost sharing approaches. And I mentioned the word MARV, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, what that means. I describe it here on this slide. I haven't really defined it yet, but I will in just a minute. Um, I want to say first that there's a wide range of autonomous technologies that are generating ocean data today, and this will certainly continue to grow. It includes uh, remote sensing from space, uh, undersea monitoring networks, uh, autonomous gliders, ocean robots. Research vessels will continue to play an important role, but one that will perhaps be more focused on activities that are best conducted by scientists at sea. And when we think about research vessels, we don't normally think about them as scalable, flexible systems. Uh, they're complex, expensive assets. They're owned and operated primarily by national governments and large institutions with large uh, administrative and maintenance budgets. That comes with accountability to government funders, which in turn influences and constrains their use and availability. And that is to be expected. Uh, but we want to talk about a slightly different paradigm that, that shifts the, the nature of this kind of, a, of an asset. MARV stands for Modular Adaptive Research Vessel, which is a name for this approach that was suggested by Doug Wallace at Dalhousie University several years ago, and we liked it. Uh, MARVs consist of a time-chartered offshore service vessel or other vessel. Time-chartered means that it comes with a trained crew and captain onto which we engineer and install globally certified modular workspace systems that support scientific work. These vessels, offshore service vessels, uh, are widely distributed globally, so they can be chartered and mobilized in the region of operation. Uh, and because they're mobilized in remote regions around the world, they require local logistics, engineering, and port services expertise. And this is provided by a port services partner. Um, this is a configuration that you can see here that supports one particular project, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, the Global Seamounts Project. You can see here the way that uh, the labs are configured and integrated with um, uh, an ROV. Uh, here's another configuration that illustrates the, the point, I think. This is a time chartered offshore service vessel. This is a rendering. Uh, and we start with this as a basic platform. Again, there are thousands of these vessels transiting uh, globally in the commercial sector. They can be chartered uh, with a day rate, and then we can mobilize them with auxiliary power, modular laboratories, uh, workshops, equipment storage, ROVs, uh, and other project specific um, equipment. So this is a mobilization <clears throat> configuration for a project uh, to go to Palau. It's the Palau Seamounts project that we're developing that we would uh, mobilize in Singapore. Um, there's more detail about this. This is all I'm going to discuss here about the nuts and bolts of putting these vessels together. There's a lot of detail on our web page. This is a shot of one of our web pages uh, on Global Mars, and I invite you to go and visit that for more information. Um, but what I just described, this approach to mobilizing commercial sector assets essentially decouples the infrastructure ownership from any particular agenda. Uh, fleet owners of these OSVs make them available when they're off contract for charter, and we have access to thousands of them through uh, international databases. So one of the um, applications for this, the ability to organize and regionally deploy uh, MARVs, uh, also represents an, an important new opportunity to enable wider access to global class science vessels and instrumentation in developing regions where institutions and communities of scientists um, otherwise lack full access to coastal and deep sea research infrastructure. The Indo-Pacific Collaborative is a project that is exploring regionally collaborative approaches including proposals for institutional consortia that can facilitate shared use at lower cost. These are 
What I'm showing here are some frameworks that we've come up with, and we are in the process of exploring this with regional stakeholders. Uh, one framework, for instance, proposes uh, to establish institutional consortia of collaborating scientists and research institutions that represent existing research networks or who share common research agendas or other criteria that can facilitate utilization of shared vessels. Another framework is to um, consider opportunities to opt in to scheduled regional expeditions that we would design with transect and ship time flexibility. Uh, and we can also um, design individual uh, expedition configurations for, for cruise proposals that are linked to specific needs that institutions or government agencies might have. So there's more than this, of course, but the important thing here is that um, this has the potential to lower the cost threshold um, through a number of, of strategies, including what's mentioned here, uh, not only ship time opportunity, but multi-leg cruises, uh, one or more back-to-back -back cruises that amortize mobilization costs. Uh, these are strategies that um, are uh, uh, important to consider. We think that uh, if we can be successful with this approach, that it will accelerate capacity development <clears throat> and it'll enable a <clears throat> regionally driven science agenda and certainly would contribute to a positive change for the future of ocean science. Uh, we're starting to explore some of these options by our involvement in the Indian Ocean Resources Forum and others to, sh to share these ideas. Um, and we also think that this strategy uh, has potential for success in the Atlantic uh, with communities in Western Africa. Uh, and we've begun discussions about this with the Air Center and others. We're excited about continuing <clears throat> to develop this. We look forward to connecting with many of you in Western Africa. And uh, as we develop this concept, I think we'll come up with some uh, additional ideas. So I also want to talk about next some um, uh, comments about computational models for a minute and how we think this will impact the need for scaling capacity for at sea research. Scientists in the EU just announced that they will be building a digital twin of the Earth. This will apparently focus mostly on weather and sea level impacts of climate change. It doesn't appear to include ecosystem modeling but it's an indication of what's developing uh, in um, computational science. Just as challenging is uh, this call in nature in 2013 for modeling all life on Earth. This article references efforts to create a general ecosystem model. And a general ecosystem model is one that would uh, incorporate uh, principles of uh, ecosystem relationships that could be applied universally presumably that all ecosystems, for example, predation play by similar rules. Uh, and what makes this kind of uh, modeling increasingly possible is advances in computational sciences, uh, advances that are so significant that computational simulation is now recognized as the third pillar of science uh, in addition to theory and experiment. And this has been um, coming to the fore just in the last 15 years or so. There are a few contributing factors here that I'd like to review that uh, are, are um, uh, enabling this, and, and one of which is computing capacity. This chart shows the impact from computer technology for solving big science questions. The increase in computer power generally described here by Moore's law um, over the last 40 years or so has, has shown an increase uh, in computing pack power of a factor of about 10 to the eighth between the early 1960s when the first computers were built to the early 2000s. And then mathematical algorithms that are used for scientific computation have continuously improved over the same period with breakthroughs occurring about every 10 years. And so they are collectively responsible for a speed up in computational capacity uh, to about 10 to the 12th. Both of these advances add up to a net benefit of about 10 to the 20th 
speed up in computational speed over this period, uh, which is equivalent to solving problems with about a billion unknowns and, and 12,000 time steps. This chart, by the way, was um, uh, uh, adapted from a presentation by Doug Arnold at the University of Minnesota, and I appreciate his uh, letting me use this chart. Um, if we look at how models are built, they start with a physical system, in this case, our marine ecosystem. And I just wanna go through this to point out the role of data in this. They begin with a physical system, the characteristics of which can be understood as continuous fields, um, usually described by differential equations. And then a, a discretization process converts these to a typically very large set of algebraic equations, which can be used to write computer code that run on computers. And an understanding of how the physical system behaves and the relationships that are present allows the construct of particular models that reflect those relationships. But the Nature article that I mentioned points out something important. And it says, obviously modeling every organism within, eco within an ecosystem is impossible. Yet certain computational techniques have been developed, mainly in marine ecology, that could allow researchers to model entire ecosystems using rules about the behavior of individuals. The biggest stumbling block to constructing GEMs, or, or really any ecosystem model, is obtaining the data to parameterize and, and, and validate them. So environmental biophysical data of sufficient scope and resolution is needed to populate models. Uh, and for the ocean, uh, as most of you know, obtaining data of this extent is not easy, especially in the deep sea, in polar regions, and in pelagic realms. And there's a distinction between data that's collected from space and autonomous sensors, and those are, that are collected by scientists on research vessels. The data needed for building computational models of complex ecosystem function, which rely on information about biodiversity, biomass, community structure, habitat structure, uh, local biogeochemistry and nutrient fluxes, and then mapping that data over specific physical structures requires physical sampling, measurement, and analysis that cannot yet be achieved with autonomous sensors or satellites. These kinds of models will be increasingly important for understanding marine ecosystem resilience under climate change and human impacts, and where there could be thresholds and tipping points of system change. And a better understanding of this is important for making decisions about resource management and conservation, and as a basis for constraining what changes under various scenarios are likely to occur. And this is much like what we see with our climate models with, uh, that are um, currently being uh, utilized. So models will be increasingly important for managing new global agreements, governing, for example, biological and mineral resource extraction in inter international waters to provide science-backed consensus on impact scenarios. Um, hundreds of models have already been developed for marine ecosystems at different scales and for different organisms. But building more integrated, holistic models of oceanic ecosystems will be an, a, a leading challenge for 21st century open science, ocean science. And there are new theoretical developments and new theoretical thinking about ecosystems as fully integrated complex systems, as described, for example, here in a new book from uh, Soren Nielsen, Brian Fath, and others that uh, is emerging and, it's, and is laying the groundwork for the development of more holistic behavioral models that can begin to eventually inform public policy. So stemming from these developments, a major project that Global Oceans has been developing over the past few years and that is now coming together is the Global Seamounts Project, which is proposing to build new advanced behavioral models of seamounts that can explore synergistic effects of multiple stressors from climate change, for example, ocean acidification, ocean warming, hypoxia, 
and human impacts from fishing, uh, mining, pollution, and where there may be thresholds of change from one state to another, where there could be indications of resilience, rates of recovery from a disturbed state, and so forth. This project relies on the ability to mobilize MARVs in sufficient number and frequency. And it's an example of how building scale and scalability, which is a function of time, that we can conduct this type of ambitious project. This illustrates here uh, briefly the working groups that have been established, the discipline focused working groups for this project. Uh, it proposes to be very comprehensive in terms of developing data for ecosystem models. Uh, we're developing workshops for this project that are along two general tracks, one to, to um, design the modeling uh, frameworks and model integration uh, strategies. And that will be linked with workshops with the field campaign so that we can have consensus on data scoping. This is a uh, chart that you saw earlier in the animation, which shows how these labs are configured for this project. You can see that they align with the various working groups um, and they integrate uh, modular labs and workspace, workshops and so forth. Um, and uh, you, can, you can get the idea of what this uh, involves. So there's also another way to build scale, uh, and that is with instrumentation. Uh, we've been collaborating with Oceaneering, which is a major uh, company uh, that builds the largest builder of ROVs in the world. Uh, and we are um, working with them to leverage uh, what is a global pool of 250 ROVs worldwide uh, rated to 3,000 and 4,000 meters. And we've worked with the uh, company to design a science module that can be readily adapted to any of these 250 ROVs uh, on the fly, uh, electronically and hydraulically that contain a, a, an array of push cores, uh, desamplers, uh, sample, sampling systems, suction samplers, box core, lights, camera, video, biogeochemical sensors, and so forth that can be dynamically integrated and essentially convert these commercial sector uh, workhorse ROVs, which are very powerful into scientific platforms. We propose to build uh, four of these initially and that will in part enable the Global Seamounts Project to conduct a um, series of expeditions within a relatively short time frame. The Seamounts Project proposes to conduct 18 expeditions uh, over 30 with 36 site surveys over about five years. And some of those are back to back, some of those are simultaneous and they'll require uh, uh, quite a number of ROVs. So this illustrates um, how this system would be integrated into the, into the Millennium and Magnum Plus systems from Oceaneering. As a special project, we've also acquired uh, from Oceaneering two 6,000 meter ROVs, the Magellan 725 in the Ocean Discovery and the Ocean Explorer 6000, which is a towed sonar system that will be rebuilt as dedicated scientific deep sea vehicles. You can read more about how we're planning to rebuild these vehicles in more detail in an article just published in ROV Planet magazine. There's a link to that on the uh, webinar links if you want to look at that in more detail. I, I will just mention the um, Ocean Explorer 6000, which will be rebuilt as a self-driving semi-autonomous single-bodied tow system powered from the surface for extended visual documentation and multi-beam sonar mapping. And this will allow the generation of high resolution bathymetry from low cost MARV platforms. And we're currently focused on exploring uh, some mapping applications in the Eastern Atlantic Ocean with this um, vehicle. 
Another project we're developing also leverages the MARV model, but on Arctic icebreakers and ice class OSVs. And in this case, uh, the SAS-X Arctic baseline project is designed, and this is an early phase project. This is still in development uh, by Global Oceans. We are um, ex essentially uh, looking at this as a project to extend the one-year synoptic Arctic data set that is scheduled to take place this year with the synoptic Arctic survey. This is an international project that involves sponsored cruises uh, in the Arctic from 10 nations utilizing standard methodologies to collect a, a, an array of core data sets and um, uh, essential ocean variables. Um, what SAS-X, X stands for extended, so we're extending the SAS-X data sets. Uh, we'll extend these data sets annually through 2030. Uh, this is this is the objective. Uh, to enable these expeditions, we can mobilize chartered icebreakers, of which there are about 40 in the commercial sector. We've taken one of these, the AVIC icebreaker, owned by Schwest in the U.S., and configured it for the project with the help of Schwest engineers. Uh, let's take a look at this. So this is a model of this particular icebreaker. Um, and starting with this deck, and here we've already mobilized the oceaneering ROVs that I talked about, <clears throat> but we can <clears throat> mount on the deck <clears throat> the uh, modular lab systems. These are certified uh, by global uh, agencies for a double stack. So we can stack these. This is the uh, proposed configuration and we can <clears throat> allocate these individual labs to the uh, various uh, areas of investigation for studying biogeochemistry, uh, plankton, benthic invertebrates, and so forth uh, that align with the set of data we wanna capture uh, as established by the original SAS project. Um, this system, as you'll note, <clears throat> is exposed though. And we're in the Arctic. The Arctic is harsh. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we've developed a, a deck mounted lab enclosure. We designed, I should say, a deck mounted lab enclosure uh, and are working with Cocoon Inc., a manufacturer of modular insulated structures, to design a shippable containerized system that's assembled port side and crane lifted over the installed lab module footprint fastened to beams that are welded on deck. And these systems are built to withstand hurricane and typhoon wind loads and snow loads in Arctic environments. And what this does is it provides a sheltered environment for working on this modular system. When the project is completed, all of these components are disassembled from the ship. Uh, the modular labs go back into service in their commercial sector, uh, the, the uh, enclosure will be disassembled and stored. And one of the things that is really important for this project it, is that we intend to involve scientists, uh, postdocs, students, indigenous communities on these expeditions. Uh, they will be an ideal platform for training the next generation of polar scientists. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this project is in an early phase. We're seeking national and institutional partners. And at the end, whoops, at the end, I will also discuss briefly uh, the funding strategy for this project. Uh, funding is important, of course, and it's a, a big challenge. I'll go over one more project. We're also developing uh, what we call the Atmospheric Instrumentation Suite or AIS facility that uh, we're developing in partnership with Argonne National Laboratory in the US. There's more about this, more detail about this important project on our website, but it will significantly expand capacity for atmospheric observations and profiling uh, over the Arctic Ocean, which will improve data for climate models. There are 
uh, significant gaps in atmospheric profiling that are not met by satellite data that can be extended uh, through this kind of a facility. We're also planning to uh, prioritize this for deployment over the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific, which will accelerate the development of computer models of Asian monsoons, which impact nearly a third of the world's populations every year. The rationale for this project is very similar for what we discussed for uh, ecosystem modeling, um, which is that there are major constraints to modeling these systems uh, when we talk about field data. So field data is a, is a major constraint. What I show here is some of the detail and more of this is on our website. This details some of the instruments that have been designed into these facilities. And these are the essential uh, parameters that can be measured from this facility. Uh, many of these instruments will come out and be mounted on the rail of the ship or the rail of the containers. Some are uh, internal to the modular systems, uh, like the radar and the aerosol systems. One of these is, a, is also a data uh, systems module. So here it shows um, we've we've installed this in, on the AVIC and, and they can be installed in different configurations on different vessels. We happen to be installing this on the on the helipad here. This ship doesn't have a helipad uh, um, hangar, so we wouldn't be taking a helicopter with us. Uh, so we have this, um, we've worked with the engineers at Schwest to utilize this platform uh, for this this type of um, application. So lastly, we think about the future of ocean science as also being about the development of new ways to fund research. And this is especially important for innovative uh, approaches. Uh, some of the things I've discussed here are fairly unique. Um, and, and it'll be increasingly important to find new ways of funding with the advent of greater international collaboration. Uh, this is an important aspect for the SASX baseline project. We are proposing that an international multi-donor trust fund uh, be established, similar to what the World Bank and UNDP have used to fund large scale development projects. This is a strategy that we're developing and there's more about that on our website. Uh, for the AIS project, we're seeking major foundation partners and other donors to fund the facility. And we're proposing that this facility, um, that the assets be owned by an independent trust with uh, trustee and advisory oversight and operated under contract to Global Oceans and Argonne as a nonprofit, non-governmental open data facility for the international scientific community. And the dynamics of that are very different than a government-owned facility that would be more typical. The, uh, by the way, the uh, uh, Seamounts project is also a project that we're proposing uh, as a uh, philanthropic major foundation uh, funded project. Uh, once it is funded, we will be uh, able to integrate funding from individual um, scientists who have funding from their own agencies. So it will host uh, a range of projects. Finally, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, this is a summary of some of the changes we think the future will bring, some of which I've already mentioned. Increased global scientific collaboration. Uh, and this is really important because uh, it, global problems require global solutions and international collaboration and the ability of emerging science communities and institutions in the global south need to have access to world-class uh, systems for research. That is generally not the case today, but we think that models like the MARV concept that can dynamically assemble these assets from the commercial sector and make them available on a dynamic basis without capital investment and the high cost of ownership 
can take a major step toward enabling access to these communities for capacity development, for regional and local research that is stakeholder driven, that can inform not only global policy and to give these scientists a seat at the table of global decision making, but also to inform local national governments about uh, their own uh, regions and their own territorial waters. This is also very important for um, uh, the small island developing states that have huge territorial waters and are very remote. And there are very few resources for exploring and documenting uh, these territorial waters. So this is a way that we can bring these resources to those communities as well. Uh, we think there will be a massive scaling up of ocean research and exploration, and that is really linked to data. Uh, the second to the last point here, uh, where predictive modeling of complex biophysical systems will uh, really come to the fore in the next several decades uh, that are enabled by the kind of computing capacity that we've discussed. Uh, we also think that capacity, physical capacity especially, will become nimble, adaptive, networked, and modular. There are ways to do this. We are building one way of doing it. Um, and we can begin to think about large-scale infrastructure like ships, more like what we think about today for autonomous systems and ocean robots that are very dynamic and very uh, very scalable. And we think that um, <clears throat> there will be increasing public-private partnerships. We're beginning to explore some of those and leverage those as well. And there will be increasing technology integration. Uh, this is going to lead to uh, things like real-time eDNA readers, uh, edge computing devices. We are um, working on that as well for the Seamounts project and developing uh, a strategy for uh, geomorphic proxies for biomass and biodiversity on the benthic seabed, and then to take those uh, geomorphic proxies and develop algorithms that can be incorporated into an edge computing device and linked to visual uh, surveys that can be analyzed with, um, with AI. And we're, we have a strategy for that. There's more about that on our website. There's a piece that's written up about that that's very interesting. Uh, and, and so I think that all of this will contribute to our ability to um, be able to predict and understand the potential impacts of climate change and human impact it will allow us to better manage and come up with solutions and global policies. Uh, and we're excited to be a part of it. So Charlie, that ends my presentation. Do you want to uh, come back on and we'll... Yes, thank you, Jim. That was uh, wonderful. Um, as always, very uh, creative and, and forward thinking. Uh, so now we enter uh, into the question and answer um, portion of the presentation. And I see that there have been several questions uh, posed to you. Uh, Jim, uh, probably more than we are going to be able to, to uh, get to uh, collectively here because we don't have enough time. But uh, let, me, um, let me highlight a few that I think uh, would uh, lend itself to some interesting, uh, interesting discussion. Um, first of all, uh, there is a um, Gerant West, and I, I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, but there's a Gerant West who asked the question, uh, one of the big design drivers in the building of research vessels is acoustic quieting. Are there suitable commercial vessels out there that would meet this requirement? It's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are some. Um, if there are sp um, specific requirements for that, uh, we can also mobilize vessels that are built for research and surveys, survey vessels that um, already incorporate that design. And those are actually part of the larger global pool that are available for a charter. 
Um, there are some vessels that may not have that characteristic built into the ship. Um, and I think part of that concern may be um, dependent on the application for what the project is going to do. Uh, if we're delivering vehicles or doing deep sea uh, ROV work um, or other kinds of um, deep sea work, it may or may not be an issue. Uh, but this is something that is really one of a host of things that normally sort of characterize a requirement. Um, I should also say that this model isn't necessarily a solution for every, sorry about that, for every um, uh, need here. It's something that we need to adapt. And I think that um, we just need to continue to explore that. Thank you. Um, there's another question uh, that um, is being uh, asked by a Christina von Hildebrandt Andrede. Uh, she's the manager of the uh, Caribbean Tsunami Warning Program. Uh, and she says that over the next decade, the global tsunami community uh, organized under UNESCO IOC uh, is seeking to scale up tsunami detection capabilities uh, over the next many years using GPS slash GNSS on ships as proposed by James Foster from the University of Hawaii. Uh, that's uh, possible uh, as an opportunity. While you focused on modular systems, that would come on and off of these vessels, would you also consider permanent instrumentation? On the vessel? Uh, well, I'm reading the question verbatim. Uh, well, uh, I, I suppose, yes. <laughs> okay, there, there are a number of possibilities for that. In some cases, we're working with um, vessel owners that have uh, relatively uh, smaller fleets of vessels um, that could be willing to work with us on that. And, and we've discussed uh, in one case for one project, we've, we've discussed installing, actually modifying the ship for a project that would be retained on the ship for future projects. Um, this can happen even if we don't have long-term charters. So if it's a long-term project and we can charter these vessels for a year or two years or 30 days or 60 days, um, and there are certain scenarios with longer term charters where we can mobilize something that does stay on the ship. Um, <clears throat> but even without that, uh, there are a number of partners that, that would probably be amenable to that. So that's depending on what's involved. Okay. Well, I think that that aims at the heart of uh, what you're trying to do with this system, which is basically to have something that's quite flexible and it uh, responds to the needs the researchers needs as they uh, as they emerge so um, yeah this is interesting interesting uh, angle on, on the, the the issues that you've raised logistics the um, uh, Jim uh, well adaptability one one quick comment adaptability is sort of the core of this there's no sort of cookie cutter approach to it it's really intended to be um, uh, integrated depending on the particular project yeah um, let's see. Uh, we have an anonymous uh, question. Uh, we know it comes from Belgium, but it's uh, uh, anonymous. Uh, and it asks, how, the stake how are the stakeholders involved while the modules are being assembled? Uh, that's the first part of the question. The second part is, can researchers bring uh, their own container? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's... <clears throat> We need to have containers that are ABS certified, uh, or if they're in a, other parts of the world, they need to have the appropriate certifications. Um, in the commercial sector, these modular systems are very robust. They're state of the art. Uh, they're, the ones we work with are globally certified with all of the global certification agencies. <clears throat> Some of the science modules that we're aware of uh, either because they're, they've been around for a while or some of the regulations have changed, uh, do not meet some of the requirements and we would not be able to host them uh, on these vessels. But for the most part, we can really host anything. Um, 
it, it doesn't have to be a, a, a piece of equipment that we provide. So um, it's, it's very open-ended. And certainly uh, one thing that I didn't mention that I should mention is that the laboratories that we're um, suggesting here are also built in a modular fashion. So there are, there are four inside of the labs, there are internal modules that can be pulled out and plugged in to provide fume hoods and cold temp low temperature storage, uh, recirculating seawater, um, various other kinds of, of features. Um, we can do two things as well. We can provide basic lab space and as well as some consumables like liquid nitrogen or gases for chromatography, but just provide a space that scientists can bring their own equipment. Uh, this is very equipment friendly in this type of approach. So uh, we're able to mount and supply clean power to any piece of equipment that a, that a PI would bring aboard. We can also um, supply equipment. So we're working with um, suppliers like Quantum Analytics that provide uh, mass spec, uh, liquid and gas chromatography, various kinds of, of other you know, um, instruments, sophisticated instruments, even including genomics um, uh, systems that can be brought aboard and installed for scientists. And that comes with spare parts. It can even come with technical support and training. So this is a trend that has been discussed uh, to some extent in the literature in terms of uh, having research ships, even within the government pools, coming up with standardized instruments rather than uh, PIs always bringing their own instruments. We see it as a, as a combination. So we would want to incorporate both. So interesting question. Uh posed by uh, Nuno Pereira. Uh, and it, it is a very interesting question. How do you plan to integrate a green approach in terms of fuels for the ship? Such a wide scale R&D project should include a green fuel approach. Yeah, that would be great. Um, there are some vessels in this sector that are green. Uh, probably not very many, but there are some, and there are some that are Arctic vessels um, that are green in terms of uh, fuel use and emissions and that sort of thing. Uh, they're not common. They're not common yet. Uh, that is a whole, you know, industry. Uh, and I think the maritime transportation industry is undergoing major changes in that area. But as these become available, if that's something that we have access to, we would definitely consider it. But um, you know, we're looking at we're looking at accessing assets that are available today. We're we're looking at you know how can we scale up uh, ocean research using what's available and using best practices and being cognizant of these issues, but you know using what is available today uh, as these other technologies come about it would be great and uh, we would certainly prioritize that. But it's something that we can um, continue to look into. Uh, this is a question from uh, Frank Mullicarger and uh, he says hi to you first, first of all. Uh, and then after that greeting, uh, uh, he says, I was wondering if you can mention some of the limitations, uh, speaking to cultural and financial uh, limitations. Uh, that have hindered government supported efforts to pick up on this model uh, of, of on-demand platforms? This is a very practical question, I suppose. Well, you know, it depends on where you're talking about. I mean, the US, for example, has a very well-developed and sophisticated um, group of assets and, and dedicated research vessels that are funded by NSF and, uh, and they're managed and they're prioritized and it works very well and has served the community well. Um, it, and, and you know, for, for something that's that well developed, it, it I think is always a challenge to introduce new ideas. Um, I think there are opportunities for um, filling gaps for, you know, surge capacity needs um, 
And I've given uh, more than one presentation to the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and we've shared these ideas. I think uh, for uh, uh, countries that have very well-developed assets like this, it's a longer term proposition. Um, for other areas that are resource constrained, including emerging economies with emerging scientific institutions and communities of scientists, um, they're very open to these ideas. And many of these nations have grow very rapidly growing economies and funding that is being allocated to scientific development, capacity development, um, but may not necessarily choose to invest in very large infrastructure like research vessels. These are very expensive. They can cost up, up to $100 million and be very expensive to maintain. So what we're seeing is a, a willingness to consider uh, incremental project-based investments for participating on international expeditions where these institutions can have a real say in, in what happens on those vessels. Um, and that's, that's essentially the idea. So, you know, the, the cultural component of that is also very important. I think one of the good things about this model is that uh, these vessels are globally distributed, which means they have multiple flags and their various flags, the nations under which they're flagged, uh, in many cases have crews that are from that country. So um, what we would tend to do in let's say Indonesia is to utilize an Indonesian flagged vessel with an Indonesian crew. Uh, and this, this is important. So um, these are things that we can, uh, that are sort of embedded in this model that I think is uh, an advantage. It's also an advantage when we're talking about access to um, territorial waters, um, having a, a very open uh, platform and a very transparent, we're a nonprofit, we're here to mobilize resources and essentially be a operational and transaction intermediary between these commercial sector assets and the scientific community. And so essentially we're here to serve the science community. Uh, we're not here to serve the commercial community. The commercial community is a resource. The science community is who we serve. So, um, you know, we can build these platforms around these concerns and needs. And if it's a requirement to have a nationally flagged vessel to do research within a particular national EEZ, then we can usually do that. Thank you, Jay. I, I think with that, we're going to have to end the session. Um, so, so first of all, thanks, thanks to Jim for a, a really inspiring uh, talk with this uh, wonderful combination of scientific vision and also the practicalities of, of, of executing that vision. And, and really, it was quite a wonderful, uh, encompassing talk, uh, Jim. So thanks so much. And thanks also for the participants. Thank you who had listened uh, hopefully attentively and those of you who uh, have posted um, questions and answers, uh, Q and A uh, uh, entries, uh, as well as through the, uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, there are too many to, to uh, respond to in the, the time that we've had allotted here. So apologies for that. Um, don't forget that there are videos of this and past sessions available on the U YouTube channel. Uh, there should be a, a link posted in the chat. Uh, also, uh, go to the webinar page of, uh, of um, Atlantic International Research Center. Uh, the Networking Fridays will continue. Uh, they always start at 1 p.m. Uh, UTC. Uh, and next week, uh, there's going to be Kostas uh, Topozelis. I uh, hope I got that right. Uh, from the University of the Aegean in Greece. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, ocean plastic pollution and uh, combating uh, the effects of that with the use of uh, satellite imagery and, and drone data uh, to uh, inventory where these uh, uh, pollution 
uh, hot spots are uh, and a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, so please all try to make that next one uh, and uh, look for the, the links and uh, try to keep, uh, keep abreast of developments on this really innovative uh, uh, webinar series. Thanks uh, a lot uh, to everyone uh, and uh, see you in the future. Take care. Thank you, Charlie. Bye-bye.